All right. And to ensure this budget protects the United States' interest and ensures America remains the partner of choice in Latin America and the Caribbean. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. And thank you to all of you for being here and, uh, this afternoon. President Joe Biden has taken every opportunity to ignore our allies in Latin America. And I'm going to explain my strong language with examples. In May of 2021, Vice President Harris challenged the United States corporations to invest in Latin America to solve the migration crisis. In that spirit, Ecuador requested a free trade agreement with us, the United States, but they were ignored up until now. Until today, Ecuador is the only country on Latin America's Pacific coast that does not have, free, does not have a free trade agreement with the United States. As well, Uruguay pleaded for a trade deal. Despite their democratic record and strategic location, they have been ignored up until today. As a consequence, last year, both countries took their business elsewhere, meaning China. Meanwhile, the Chinese trade with Latin America has exploded from 12 billion in 2000 to 495 billion last year making it the biggest trading partner in the Western Hemisphere. That is very troublesome. By contrast, the Oval Office has graciously welcomed Colombia's President Gustavo Petro, a socialist, Argentina's President Alberto Fernandez, whose VP Cristina Kirchner is among the most corrupt politicians in South America, and Brazil's President Lula da Silva, who was sentenced to 12 years for corruption before returning to power. This administration, unfortunately, has denied that welcoming gesture to some conservative presidents since entering the White House. For example, Guatemala's President Jamate told me personally over the phone that he felt disregarded by President Biden. We know Guatemala is a critical choke point on the path through Central America, and it holds one of the keys to ending illegal immigration at our southern border. But the White House has ignored them as well, sanctioning some of Guatemala's top government officials. Let's go to the Caribbean, where our ally, President Abinader from the Dominican Republic, has been overlooked despite his aggressive anti-corruption measures and economic growth. He has cried over the phone to myself again for help to end the humanitarian crisis in Haiti, his neighbor. But we abandoned the Dominicans and the Haitians and hoping for the Canadians to step in, but they never have. On top of that, the White House issued a travel ban that labeled the Dominicans racists, damaging their tourism for six months. When I asked Secretary Blinken to provide evidence of that racism, nothing was presented, but thankfully the ban has been lifted. Now let's go to El Salvador, where President Biden also rejected a visit from President Najib Bukele. President Bukele inherited the most dangerous country in Latin America, and in three years, he's made it a safe haven for tourism and for investment. He dismantled gangs, reduced the murder rate by 60%, and opened the country for business. El Salvador's economy has raised historical averages for the second has raised historical averages for the second year in a row, but the White House unfortunately threatened their progress by sanctioning five of his top government officials. Let's go to Panama. A Panamanian foreign minister informed to my office in my presence of their request to buy nothing. He, they don't want anything given. They want to buy helicopters and military vehicles from the Biden administration to secure the Darien Gap. Once again, they assured me that they did not want anything free. They wanted tools to secure the bottleneck between South and Central America, but they are still waiting. Ignoring our allies in Latin America is a vacuum that is being filled by China, Russia, and Iran. In another case, a few days after President Biden stopped buying oil from Russia, top Latin American advisor in the White House, Mr. Juan Gonzalez, got on a plane to visit President Maduro. But at the time, Maduro wasn't even recognized as the legitimate president and was on the FBI's most wanted list for $15 million on his head. 
We struck a deal to buy some of the dirtiest oil produced on the planet. I wanted to hear complaints from the environmentalists surrounding President Biden, but they have remained silent. Now let's look at Cuba. The regime has spread the most anti-American poison in the last 60 years. But we have removed the cap on remittances to give oxygen to their repressive apparatus. We have welcomed the Coast Guard to our military installations, and we have sent some delegations to the island and lifted sanctions on tourism. Something is very wrong with our foreign policy when we are helping Cuba's tourism more than Dominican Republic's tourism industry. And now, I'm not sure if you know, that the Cuban regime announced that Cuban soldiers are going to be going to Russia to be on the front lines fighting the Ukrainians. This budget doesn't reflect reality. Your actions show that you have ignored our allies to the benefit of our enemies, unfortunately. I'm just going to say a quick message in Spanish, and then we can proceed to the questions. A los países de América Latina. Les pedimos disculpas por el maltrato y menosprecio que han recibido por parte de la administración del presidente Biden. Es inconcebible que los Estados Unidos ignore a los aliados del hemisferio que han demostrado los mismos valores de libertad, democracia y libre mercado que defendían los padres fundadores de este país. Este comité tiene un compromiso de levantar sus voces en el corazón del Congreso Federal. En el Partido Republicano hay gente que sabe respetar a los vecinos, a los aliados de los Estados Unidos a nuestros vecinos más queridos. The chair now recognizes the ranking member, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Castro, for an opening statement. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here today at our subcommittee's budget hearing to examine the Biden administration's request for funding towards our nation's foreign policy priorities in the Western Hemisphere. I've long said that our neighbors to the South are our most important ally. We're united by shared bonds of culture and heritage, and by economic cooperation that supports millions of jobs here in the United States and also millions of jobs in Latin America and the Caribbean. It's not only beneficial but essential that we work with our neighbors on issues from migration to democracy promotion and security cooperation. This budget request shows that the Biden administration is prioritizing our engagement with the he Western Hemisphere. As the 2022 National Security Strategy says, quote, no region impacts the United States more directly than the Western Hemisphere, unquote. And I'm going to lay out a few of the issues that I believe the administration needs to prioritize, and I look forward to hearing from the witnesses on their own approach. Uh, the first is fentanyl. Fentanyl, as you all know, is a serious challenge to public health, and my heart goes out to the Americans who have lost friends and loved ones to the fentanyl epidemic. They deserve real solutions that address the threats of transnational criminal organizations and invest in a broader public health response that tackles demand side issues as well. Unfortunately, some of the recent ideas proposed by some of my colleagues, including bombing the cartels or putting American soldiers at risk in Mexico, are not serious or credible ideas. Therefore, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on how the United States and Mexico have continued to cooperate on and address these concerns through concrete, impactful, and focused efforts. Second is armed trafficking. Just as we look to work with the Mexican government to fight fentanyl trafficking, I believe we need to do more to stop the trafficking of firearms from the United States into Mexico. The vast majority of weapons used by cartels in Mexico and the Caribbean originate in our nation, the United States. No effort to take on these cartels is serious if we don't address this issue. I author the Armas Act to align U.S. government efforts to combat the trafficking of firearms. And earlier this year, I requested that the U.S. Government Accountability Office produce a comprehensive report into firearms trafficking into the Caribbean. The United States needs to acknowledge the role our weapons play in perpetuating violence in these countries. And I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on progress made on this issue in the last few years. Next, migration. The Western Hemisphere is currently facing the biggest migration crisis in decades, fueled by political turmoil, failing institutions, and climate change. But the reality is, the majority of displaced people in our region are not at our border. They remain within other Latin American countries, like Costa Rica, 
which has welcomed hundreds of thousands of Nicaraguan migrants, and Colombia and Ecuador, which have provided temporary sta status for millions of Venezuelans. While 7 million Venezuelans have been displaced in recent years, 6 million of those remain in the Latin American region, not in the United States, and not at our border. Our neighbors have stepped up, and they want to do more, but they also need our help. I think there's an issue with the audio. I look forward to hearing about what we can do to help these countries with the integration of migrants as part of our border strategy and on migration in the hemisphere. And finally, on TPS, uh, I want to urge the administration to redesignate temporary protected status for countries affected by ongoing U.S. court cases, including Nicaragua, Honduras, and El Salvador. I sincerely hope that the administration pursues a redesignation of TPS not merely an extension or renewal of TPS. Absent broader congressional action, redesignating TPS for these nations could be the single most consequential thing the Biden administration does on immigration and would meaningfully help thousands of families. I also look forward to hearing from the witnesses on U.S. policy towards the Caribbean and how we will address democratic backsliding and human rights violations in the hemisphere. Uh, additionally, I want to publicly call for the release and return of Evan Hernandez, who has been wrongfully detained in Venezuela since March 2022. Uh, I know that uh, Congresswoman Kamlanger Dove, his representative in California, has been working hard to bring him home. And thank you to our witnesses for being here today and for your commitment to public service. And thank you, uh, Chairwoman Salasad, for convening this hearing. Thank you. And other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. Now, we're pleased to have a distinguished panel of witnesses before us today on this important topic. Let's start with Mr. Brian Nichols, is the Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs at the Department of State. We have Mr. Todd Robinson, is the Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement at the Department of State. We have Ms. Julieta Valls Noyce, is the Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration at the Department of State. And Ms. Marcela Escobari is the Assistant Administrator in the Bureau for Latin America and the Caribbean at the United States Agency for International Development. Your full statements will be made part of the record, and I will ask each of you to keep your spoken remarks to five minutes in order to allow time for members' questions. Now I recognize Assistant Secretary Nichols for his opening statement. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Chairwoman Salazar, Ranking Member Castro, and distinguished members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to speak with you about the administration's proposed FY 2024 budget for the Western Hemisphere. The Western Hemisphere is experiencing the most pivotal moment in the last 30 years. The ability of the United States to advance its national security interests at a time of dynamic change while continuing to galvanize regional action in response to regional and global challenges requires a clear articulation of our approach to the Western Hemisphere that supports accountable and representative democracies, a prosperous middle class, thriving communities, and sustainable development. The Department's FY 2024 budget request demonstrates our sustained engagement and support of the President's vision of a region that is secure, middle class, democratic, in contrast to the transactional approach of our strategic competitors. More than in any other part of the world, competition between major powers in the Western Hemisphere directly affects the prosperity and security of the United States and our people. Though the People's Republic of China has become the tra trading partner for the four largest economies in South America, the United States remains by far the largest source of investment and remittances in the region. However, to compete more effectively, the United States will employ the full toolkit at our disposal. Similarly, 
21 Latin American and Caribbean countries have signed on to the Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI. But the expansion of BRI has also brought with it buyer's remorse for many countries in the region. Countries tire of China's lack of transparency and its disrespect for norms and freedoms that characterize its commercial engagement. Nations bristle at the PRC's absence of engagement and consultation with non-state stakeholders, including civil society, that underpin regional support for democracy. Worse still is the widespread understanding that PRC offerings always come with strings attached. By contrast, most of the countries in the Western Hemisphere view the United States as a partner of choice on matters of governance, rule of law, trade, and human rights. Now they want to provide, uh, present a viable alternative to Chinese economic engagement. It is vital that we answer their call. Our proposed budget will use diplomatic engagement and foreign assistance strategically to build partnerships in areas of common interest. We are doing that through the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity. We will create compelling conditions for U.S. companies to do business, help our partners analyze the risks of working with strategic adversaries, and develop safeguards against cyber attacks, illegal resource extraction, and other malign activities. These investments are vital to our neighbor's safety, prosperity, and democratic future, as well as our own. This budget prioritizes comprehensive solutions to address the political, economic, and security challenges driving irregular migration. We request $979 million for state and U.S. aid to implement the U.S. strategy for addressing the root causes of migration in Central America in alignment with the United States Northern Triangle Enhanced Engagement Act. The budget also includes $184 million for programs that advance legal pathways, integrate migrants, and stabilize communities that host them. Of this amount, $51 million for the America's Partnership Opportunity Fund will hum, help countries take responsibility for long-term migration management through sustainable public planning and community-based solutions. Funds used to message directly to prospective migrants will raise awareness of U.S. immigration laws and programs and the dangers of irregular migration. With U.S. support, democratic governments that honor the rights of all persons and deliver for their people will foster societies where citizens can feel they can build their futures at home. The proposed budget bolsters democracy, social inclusion, and human rights by funding support to civil society, democratic actors, independent meeting, media, and the Organization of American States and its Inter-American Commission on Human Rights to hold governments accountable. Bolstering democratic institutions will help us push back against democratic backsliding, corruption, and the false narratives perpetrated by illiberal regimes. The proposed budget includes more than $291 million for Haiti to address longstanding food insecurity, political instability, gang activity, and complements the objectives of the 10-year plan to implement the U.S. strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability in Haiti. Efforts to combat gang activity focus on enhanced training and equipment for the Haitian National Police. This assistance is necessary but not sufficient on its own to build a more stable and economically viable Haiti, focusing on improving health and education outcomes, advancing economic and food security, and improving the independence and accountability of government institutions. We are under no illusions that the international community can solve deeply rooted problems in Haiti without Haitian actors coming together to find a way forward. Finally. The budget includes $370 million to build climate resilience through programs that contribute to protecting biospheres like the Amazon, advancing clean energy solutions, enhancing food security, building early warning and response systems for natural disasters, and improving enforcement of environmental crimes, often perpetrated by tr transnational criminal organizations and companies li linked to strategic competitors. Our budget priorities for the Western Hemisphere envis envision a hemisphere that thrives together to benefit the American people. I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Nichols, and now recognize Assistant Secretary Robinson for his opening statement. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Salazar, Ranking Member Castro, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. The Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs, INL, is responsible for nearly $1.4 billion of foreign assistance globally under the International Narcotics Control and Law Enforcement uh, Account request. This includes $536.5 million in INCL funding for the Western Hemisphere. It's about 38% of the total INCL request. 
Countering the flow of fentanyl and its precursors is a top priority. The CDC estimates nearly 110,000 people in the United States died of a drug overdose in 2022, with a majority involving fentanyl. The State Department is leading a global response to the synthetic drug challenge by disrupting transnational criminal organizations' ability to produce, traffic, and profit from these deadly substances. Most fentanyl seized in the United States is trafficked through Mexico using diverted precursor chemicals sourced from the People's Republic of China. Our cooperation with Mexico is critical to the success of our efforts to combat the fentanyl crisis. We recognize that disrupting the flow of precursor chemicals is crucial uh, to including engagement with the PRC and others to better track and control these chemicals. We believe INL is implementing programs that are making an, an impact against fentanyl. For example, we've provided more than 500 canines to Mexican agencies to assist in seizures of fentanyl and other drugs. Since 2019, these canines have seized nearly 485,000 fentanyl pills, representing tens of thousands of lives potentially saved. We also cannot ignore other counter-narcotics challenges in our hemisphere. Our approach in Colombia and Peru has evolved from a focus on just cocaine reduction into a balanced approach addressing factors enabling production and trafficking. This includes promoting rural security, justice and development, drug demand reduction, and addressing corruption and money laundering. In Ecuador, with INL's assistance, the government has launched a specialized court with jurisdiction over drug trafficking, human trafficking, kidnapping, and money laundering cases. In Haiti, INL is building the, the Haitian National Police's capacity to counter the violent gangs driving instability. In the Caribbean, through the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative, INL programming reduces illicit narcotics trafficking and illicit firearms, disrupts organized crime, and promotes uh, regional cooperation. In Central America, INL efforts focus on reducing the governance and security drivers of irregular migration. Programs to improve community policing and engage youth, de youth deter gang influence and crime. Corruption and impunity siphon resources from the commun communities that need them, enabling insecurity and robbing citizens of economic opportunity. INL works with partner nations to identify and prosecute this corruption. In many countries in our hemisphere, anti-democratic governments are closing the space for productive engagement. We thus have increased our collaboration with local civil society and independent media to, com to combat the corruption, crime, and impunity uh, threatening the region. Finally, INL ensures partners in the region remain committed to the rule of law and rules-based systems. They need to be aware of the risk to risks to partnering with, with the PRC as opposed to the benefits of the United States as their security partner of choice. Getting ahead of all of these threats requires strategic and, in, and innovative thinking. The challenges before us are immense, but I am confident we can address them together to keep our country and people safe. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Robinson. I now recognize Assistant Secretary Vals Noyce for her opening statement. Good afternoon, Chair Salazar, Ranking Member Castro, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be here with my colleagues to speak about the critical work that we are doing together in the Americas. My remarks here su uh, summarize the written testimony I already provided. As we gather today, Western Hemisphere governments are confronting the largest displacement crisis in history. Of the more than 100 million people forced to abandon their homes, families, and livelihoods globally, some 20 million are in this hemisphere, including more than 7 million Venezuelans. The problem is complex, it is growing, and it is increasingly clear that no single country can tackle it alone. This is why 20 other Western Hemisphere leaders joined President Biden in endorsing the Los Angeles Declaration on Migration and Protection on the margins of the Summit of the Americas last year. 
The LA Declaration calls for regional approaches to address migration challenges and make progress on shared priorities. We are already seeing progress. In response to growing needs, the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration provided nearly $580 million in humanitarian assistance for the Western Hemisphere in fiscal year 2022. This assistance helped deliver life-saving aid like water and emergency health care to refugees, asylum seekers, and other vulnerable migrants. It also supports integration and livelihoods programs to countries throughout the hemisphere to provide solutions closer to home for displaced people who might otherwise pursue dangerous migration onward, including to the United States. It funds capacity building work to develop effective and efficient asylum systems in partner countries. It gives local communities resources to respond to migration and forced displacement. And it gets results. With PRM assistance, partner organizations helped Colombia develop and implement a 10-year temporary protected status program that so far has allowed 1.6 Venezuelans, million Venezuelans, to work and access health and education services. PRM also funded the UN Refugee Agency to help Mexico grow its national asylum agency and streamline processes to manage a seven-fold increase in applications. Mexico has become a viable destination for asylum applicants who, again, might otherwise have sought asylum in our country. Right now, the department is bringing together existing and available resources to the table to surge support to the region to the maximum extent possible. We are substantially expanding migration-related programming in this hemisphere this year as we reevaluate assistance priorities. And as we make difficult decisions and look forward to future requirements, we will do so in close coordination with the Congress. Meanwhile, we are also expanding our own refugee resettlement efforts in the hemisphere. The President committed to resettling 20,000 refugees over two years from our hemisphere, and we are working to make that number even higher. At the same time, we are building a resettlement diplomacy network of governments around the world to expand overall global refugee resettlement capacity and share responsibility for refugee resettlement more equally. I hosted a productive meeting of senior officials of this network in Washington just last week. We're also working in close partnership with the Department of Homeland Security on humane migration management as part of a comprehensive hemispheric approach to migration. This includes a new initiative of regional processing centers for lawful migration pathways that we are now calling Movilidad Segura, Safe Mobility. Under Movilidad Segura, our international organization partners will run regional offices where they will pre-screen refugees for resettlement and provide migrants information on other lawful pathways to the United States and other countries or for local integration or for voluntary returns home. Refugees and other vulnerable migrants will be able to visit these offices to get critical information and assistance without putting themselves in the hands of smugglers or in the way of danger. We are committed to responsible stewardship of limited resources to meet growing humanitarian needs in the Americas and beyond. We are actively seeking new ways to multiply the impact of every taxpayer dollar. We're looking beyond traditional bilateral approaches and working with the international financial institutions and the MDBs. We've launched a public-private partnership for refugee employment, and we uh, are pursuing other initiatives to put together both our humanitarian assistance and our development funding in ways that multiply the effect of both. So in closing, I want to thank the members of this committee for holding this hearing and giving us the opportunity to discuss the work we're doing to meet the challenges of the moment. We appreciate your support, and I thank you and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Vals Noyce. I now recognize Assistant Administrator Escobari for her opening statement. Chair Salazar, Ranking Member Castro, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today. We have a vested interest in the stability and prosperity of our closest neighbors, and the President's 2024 budget request for USAID allows us to continue to be good partners on our shared interests, good neighbors, and good stewards of taxpayer dollars. Our approach to development, building long-term relationships, 
showing up in times of need, and delivering lasting results works, and it stands in direct contrast to the often opaque and opportunistic approach of the PRC. When we are good partners toward a more democratic and prosperous hemisphere, our work advances our national security goals. For example, development can and has played a critical role in responding to the historic levels of migration across the region. USAID's holistic approach complements broader USG efforts by first addressing the root causes of migration and giving people the option to stay in their communities. We're creating economic opportunity and tackling insecurity and corruption. Our work is helping women like Mercedes, who I met last month in Guatemala, turn her subsistence farm into a business that is now prosperous enough to enable her husband, who had migrated abroad, to come home. Second, our support of H-2 visa programs helps people come to the U.S. to work in conditions of dignity, safety, and mutual benefit. Guest workers fill jobs in places like Utah and Alaska and then return home with more skills and resources to support their families and invest in their communities. And third, we invest in the integration of migrants in partner countries. Our support of Colombia and Ecuador as they implement their generous TPS policy has helped Venezuelans displaced by the disastrous Maduro regime. They can now put their kids in school, access health care, get jobs, open bank accounts, and settle where they are. This budget requests $83 million to expand on these integration programs. Now, we know that the real sources of political instability in the region are autocracy and corruption. And this budget requests $535 million to support independent media, human rights and rule of law, and to help democracies deliver for their citizens. With $50 million in Venezuela, USAID will push for more competitive elections in 2024, making it harder for the Maduro regime to commit election fraud. With $20 million in state and aid funding for Cuba and $15 million for Nicaragua, we will continue to support those on the front lines fighting for their most basic rights and freedoms. We are also there when disaster strikes. In 2022 alone, USAID provided $500 million in emergency response in 12 countries. We responded to floods in Peru, the earthquake in Ecuador, volcanic eruptions in St. Vincent, forest fires in Chile, and much more. We continue to support the Haitian people whose lives have been appended by gang violence. USAID is reaching 700,000 Haitians with food, food and supports over 150 health clinics, which most recently helped limit the outbreak of cholera. 246 million in FY24 for Haiti will allow us to meet these urgent needs while we work toward a diplomatic solution on security. We know that our aid will always be small relative to the size of the challenges. So we focus on solving market failures and piloting solutions that local governments and companies can then adopt and expand. With modest loan guarantees, we helped unlock over a billion dollars in commercial bank finance for small businesses in former conflict zones in Colombia. We piloted new carbon markets and 24-hour courts to combat gender-based violence, which now continued forward on their own. This budget will also allow us to double down with neighbors who embrace reform, like the Dominican Republic. We are helping them carry out transparent public procurements that facilitate investments in strategic infrastructure like the Port of Manzanillo, which is now allowing the DR to capitalize on nearshoring opportunities. We seek to make investments that generate impact far beyond our dollars. During my recent trip to the region, I heard repeatedly from our partners that now is when we're needed the most. With an uneven economic recovery and democratic values under attack, our allies have asked for our help. USAID is prepared to give it, and this budget will make that possible. Thank you for this subcommittee's commitment for Latin America and the Caribbean, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Assistant Administrator Escobar, and now I recognize myself for five minutes of questioning. Your mic is off. Yeah, thank you once again for being here, um, uh, Mr. Nichols, and uh, I, I recognize that I'm gonna echo your words that fentanyl is our number one problem that we need to work with Mexico. 
but I'm going to talk about Mexico in a few minutes. Let me start with Colombia. Colombia is right now the number one producer of coke. They have, uh, they have the resources to produce cocaine and uh, many other drugs. And I just want to ask you, did anyone in the United States government receive a call from anyone in the Petro administration to cancel ex-ambassador Armando Benedetti's visa to the United States? Uh, Madam Chairman, I'm not aware that any person in our administration has received such a call. And do you know why this government canceled ex-ambassador Armando Benedetti's visa to the United States? Uh, I'm afraid I can't discuss the individual visa cases, um, and I'd have to refer you to the Bureau of Consular Affairs. And why do you think his bi – do you have any idea why the visa was canceled? The – well – uh, I note that uh, he's... You're the top guy. I'm sure they have to call you and tell you, hey, we're going to do this and that. Benedetti is, you know, I don't have to explain to you who he is and the importance he may have in bringing information to us as to how the Petro cam presidential campaign was funded. Well, uh, he's subject to investigation in Colombia at this moment. His government withdrew his accreditation to Venezuela uh, and uh, it's currently the subject of uh, investigation uh, in his home country. Uh, I have full faith in Colombian institutions to get to the bottom of this matter. But you know that he said that he's been willing to say who financed President Petro's campaign. So I'm sure that you're interested in knowing that piece of information. So my question is if Mr. Benedetti wants to come in front of this forum to tell us to tell us in particular who financed Petro's campaign. Will you give him the visa? And don't tell me that that belongs to the Bureau of Visas because you are the top guy and you can make the call and say, yeah, give it to him so he can come to the United States. Would you be willing to do that? I, I don't have the authority to issue visas. Sure you do. What I would sure, suggest but you can call. You can call Benedetti. and say we would like the guy to be in the United States. I would suggest that Ambassador Benedetti uh, use his already demonstrated ability to talk to the media, to use Twitter, and to talk to Colombian authorities to tell his story. But Twitter is not under oath in front of this committee. So I'm saying is can I count on your word to, to grant, to help us get the visa for Benedetti? The, I would encourage him to work with Colombian authorities so that his own government can investigate the allegations in play. Uh, let's, let me now, I'll get back to you on that, but thank you. Let me now talk to um, Mr. Robinson. Thank you again. Once the uh, first time that, uh, that we have the ability to talk to each other. I have, I'm going to paraphrase uh, some of the phrases that uh, on your testimony, and basically the phrase that stuck out is that the space for productive engagement is closing as anti-democratic governments have gained power. And that's true. And I wish you were talking about Nicaragua or about Venezuela or Cuba, but you're talking about Guatemala and El Salvador. And you said that we have, or you just said right now, innovative thinking, strategic. So basically, uh, what you're saying is that you're not going to work with the AGs, the attorney generals of Guatemala and El Salvador, and this government is not going to provide resources to those two um, government uh, uh, officials who they are in charge of fighting drugs, crime. So you're going to be canceling two of the key countries in Central America. Why? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for the mm -hmm. for the question. Uh, the short answer is we are. We continue to work with uh, both of those governments on issues that are important to us, including uh, uh, counter narcotics. Uh, but you said that you're not going to work with their AGs. Uh, I I have not said we're not going to work with our AGs, but I would note that I think both AGs have been sanctioned by uh, by the uh, Biden Harris. Uh, administration for anti, anti either anti-democratic or corrupt uh, But issues. listen, you have a lot of anti-democratic people at, at governments in this hemisphere, starting with people that w you work with all the time. Venezuela, we're buying oil. Uh, Cuba, we're sending delegations. And Nicaragua, so, so I understand that there are no saints in the hemisphere, but we have to work with El, uh, El Salvador and Guatemala 
for our own benefits and our own interests, right, of stopping fentanyl. So, so w how, how can we work with these two governments that, according to your statement, you're not going to work with your AGs well because of that, those anti-democratic governments? Wha what I would say is we, we, in fact, are working with both of these governments. We're working with them on uh, migration issues. We are working with them on counter-narcotics issues. Uh, we are supplying them with uh, 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 technical assistance and equipment that they need to, to go after uh, the narcotics traffickers that are uh, uh, trafficking uh, drugs, precursor chemicals, So you're people. backtracking your statement that you are going to work with the AGs. We, we have been. We, we are working with uh, uh, national police. Uh, we are working with civilian security. Uh, we are working with those prosecutors uh, that we think can be useful and, and are not uh, working in an anti-democratic uh, or corrupt manner. Yes, we will find, we will find people to work with. Okay. Um, I just want to point out the fact that you said that Honduras, you can work with Honduras because it's less corrupt than the other two. But I just want to point out the fact that the president of Honduras, one of her fir first acts of, co of government after she was elected president was to pardon all officials from her husband's male salias that were accused of corruption charges against them. So you're telling me that Honduras is less corrupt than Guatemala and El Salvador, and the first act of government from this lady is to pardon people who are in jail for corruption? What I would say is we have to find ways to work with those countries uh, that are crucial to fighting counter-narcotics, uh, fighting corruption, uh, and, uh, and, and we have to support their democratic institutions. That's what uh, my bureau, INL, is, is focused on, and we will find those actors in those governments that are willing to do that. Um. Ms. Julieta, let me just ask you, um, let's, let's go a little bit uh, to the harrowing experiences that you heard on your recent trip to Nelco, Necocli in Colombia. Just uh, narrate for us one of the most grueling experiences that you experienced there. Thank you, Chair Salazar. Uh, I visited Colombia in March and met with our international organization partners who are doing a lot of work to help support integration and capacity building for Colombian authorities. Uh, but I also had the opportunity to visit the beachfront town of Necocli, which is basically the entrance point into the Darien Gap. It's a beautiful little beach town, and it was one of the most awful mornings of my life. And tell me. Uh, the because I saw hundreds of people masked there um, who had spent all of the money that they had, had sold everything, given up everything that they had in order to try and find a better life for their families, and in doing so had put themselves in the hands of criminal organizations to try and smuggle them through this, this jungle, this otherwise impenetrable jungle. Uh, and I, it broke my heart because I saw people there with babies in strollers carrying a few treasured possessions and, and some of them, I think, naively thinking that it was just going to be a walk through a park when, in fact, they were going into a true tropical jungle with all of the dangers implicit in the wildlife and the insects and the snakes, but also the dangers that come from the criminal organizations. Mm -hmm. And some of the people who I saw, I am convinced, will never emerge from that jungle. They will be killed, they will be raped, they will be exploited. And that is just the beginning of the passage, because if they make it through the jungle, many of them will try to continue onward to try to make it to our border. Right. And that is why it is so important for us to find new, innovative solutions like these safe mobility offices that we're trying to establish around the region so that the criminal organizations no longer have the ability and to that's meter And that's this. what we're all trying to do. Thank you for your... Okay, I'm going to now recognize Ranking Member Castro for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, as we discussed, the vast majority, and I discussed earlier, the vast majority of migrants displaced in the Western Hemisphere are in countries like Venezuela, Ecuador, Costa Rica, Panama, and Mexico. And so uh, this question is for Assistant Administrator Escobari 
and as Assistant Secretary Noyes. Uh, what specific efforts are you undertaking or proposing to help countries integrate uh, these migrants? And can you walk me through how effective U.S. funding would be if directed towards this purpose? And uh, I know there's a lot of ground to cover there, but maybe you all could do it as succinctly as possible. No, thank you, Cong Congressman. Um, as, as you rightly noted, what is different of this crisis is the seven million people coming out of um, Venezuela and that are being absorbed in South America. The growth of migration of migrants has grown inside of Latin America 17 times more than from Latin America to the U.S. So it is these countries that are taking the burden and have taken really historic um, um, policies, both in terms of their pragmatism and their generosity, to give them, to get, take them out of the sho uh, shadows and let them work and settle in those countries. We were next to the Colombian government from the moment they, they, they started implementing this. We gave them 400 surge staff to be able to do the TPS, are helping in Peru um, many uh, migrants validate their degree so that they can actually work because the Peruvian government allowed them to validate during the pandemic, particularly healthcare workers, and they've added tremendously in the response. And similarly, Colombia is making the bet, which they have shown in numbers that they, if they successfully integrate these migrants, it is going to uh, end up providing over $2 billion to their GDP. So where we hope to help, this is, the problem is that it is very politically costly to do this. The cost is now and the benefit is later. So we are, are, are helping them with our colleagues at stake, but it is still um, a, a small percentage of the need. Right now we are the largest funders and I think we do need to galvanize the rest of the international community because what we learn from that integration work is going to be helpful for the rest of the world because dislocation is only going to grow. So I would just jump in to thank the Congress for the appropriations that it has delivered to allow us to provide support to these countries for the life-saving work that they're doing over the last uh, since 2017, the United States has provided $2.8 billion worth of humanitarian assistance to support Venezuelan migrants in 17 countries. And as a result of that support, most of those Venezuelans have stayed in the Americas, where there are perhaps more cultural affinities, linguistic affinity, and they're closer to home because the majority of them, what they really want to do is to return safely one day to their country. But right now, that's just not possible to a place like Venezuela. Nicaraguans are also leaving. There are people leaving from other countries in our hemisphere. So th all of the support that you generously appropriate to allow us to support these people helps keep people <coughs> closer to home and closer to a longer-term solution. Oh, thank you. And I think the chairwoman has generously said I can go over two or three minutes on these remarks. And oh, thank you. And in that spirit, I wanted to respond to some of your opening statements. Um, as you can imagine, you know, we have a bit of counter takes on some of it. Uh, and just wanted to go through some of those countries and kind of what we're seeing in terms of engagement. Uh, on Guatemala, you know, elections are coming up on June 25th. And Guatemalan judges largely be perceived to be under the influence of President Giamete have banned four of the top opposition presidential candidates from participating. But the, the front runner, conservative Pineda, was suspended from running two weeks ago. The other three candidates represented indigenous populations and were ba banned based on false allegations of bribery and embezzlement to links with drug cartels. And many democracy indexes have categorized Guatemala as a hybrid regime, just barely above authoritarian. Uh, the United States government has sanctioned numerous government officials for corruption, uh, including Attorney General Porras. And last month, uh, El Periódico, an outlet famous for investigating corruption cases, was forced to shut down due to intimidation, harassment, and arrest of its journalists. In Cuba, the Biden administration's re-engagement with Cuba has allowed for the restart of remittances, which is essential for survival and family reunification programs. <laughs> the United States government is also better able to collaborate on law enforcement, migration, and economic opportunity. And Cuba has, has opened up its business and private sector to a level unseen in years. More and more Cuban entrepreneurs are advocating for the United States to support them and the people through lessened sanctions. Re-engagement with the Maduro regime has allowed the United States and its partners to better support the Venezuelan people. 
whether it's those who are trying to reunite with their family in the region or in the United States or fight for democracy. Negotiations in Colombia and Mexico have made meaningful progress, including through the agreed creations of a UN-monitored humanitarian fund that will provide support directly to the people from sanctioned assets. While providing Maduro with legitimacy with regard to Venezuela is dangerous, we must work to uplift democratic institutions and humanitarian access in that country. We support efforts to ensure Venezuela's 2024 election is as free and fair as possible following the end of the interim government led by Mr. Guaido, which means recognizing the legitimacy of the candidate chosen to run by the Unitary Opposition Party. In El Salvador, 132 of the people jailed in El Salvador's state of exception died without a trial, without having been found guilty of their accused crimes. Over 66,000 people have been arrested under the state of exception, many without due process, access to counsel, or adequate prison conditions. They face torture and denial of food and medical services. This is a dangerous precedent for the region, implying that the way to deal with criminal activity and gangs is to suspend human rights and increase violent and arbitrary enforcement. The systematic violation of human rights and dismantling of the rule of law are not the answer to these problems. This strategy also criminalizing, criminalizes those living in poverty and in gang-ridden neighborhoods. And then finally, on Mexico and fentanyl, 86% of fentanyl traffickers are American citizens, not migrants, not cartel members, American citizens, our own people. The Biden administration in Mexico recently announced agreements to crack down on labs and smuggling as well as increased information sharing, despite rhetoric, rhetoric from AMLO. The United States has increased funding while Mexico has committed to increased staffing. In April, the White House increased sanctions to combat fentanyl trafficking. While rhetoric on invading Mexico may seem unrealistic, members of the House Foreign Affairs Committee have called for invading Mexico and used the designation of fentanyl as a chemical weapon and basis for such military action. Uh, Representative Crenshaw and Representative Waltz introduced an AUMF against the cartels, which has a total of 20 co-sponsors. Majority of Republican presidential candidates have expressed openness or support for military action even without Mexico's cooperation, permission, or support. And Congress commissioned an extensive report last year which determined that progress against fentanyl would be achieved only by pairing enforcement with a reduction in U.S. demand. Thank you, Chair. I yield back. I now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Congressman Self. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, very interested in some of your written testimony. Uh, we'll go quickly since, uh, since I do have to leave. Uh, Mr. Robinson, uh, you said that with regarding uh, cocaine, you wanted to increase security and, and decrease criminality. What do you mean by decrease criminality in regards to cocaine? Uh, I suspect, I'm not knowing the context, I suspect we mean uh, increase the decrease the uh, ability of people, the, the reasons for people to join in this criminality. Mm. Um, when we think about um, Mexico, it is certainly a trading, uh, important trading partner, but I believe now we have determined that uh, rather than the less than hundred billions of dollars, the cartel uh, operations are now worth well over several hundred billion dollars when we consider human trafficking, drug trafficking, sex trafficking. Uh, they've taken over the avocado crop, I think. Uh, so uh, how in the world are we going to address that without direct action? I mean, y'all are all about soft power here. How in the world are we going to get at the cartels? And would you, and here's the direct question, uh, do you consider Mexico close to a failed state? I, I do not consider Mexico close to a failed state, number one. Uh, and there is direct action, number two. Uh, on both sides of the border, both the United States and in Mexico, uh, our law enforcement uh, people are facing these cartels every day, and they're dying on both sides of the border. So there is direct, a direct action going on. And I will, I will say, while I admire your 200K resettlement, I think the number is probably closer to 5 million. 
under the uh, Biden administration. Um, I, I want to turn to Mr. Nichols. Uh, you testified that uh, China is now the top trading partner for the four largest economies in South America, and yet we're by far the greatest source of investment. Does that not seem like an oxymoron to you? Uh, thank you, Congressman. No, it does not. The, uh, uh, the issue is that a number of countries in South America are large commodity producers. Uh, so countries like Brazil sell soy, uh, fertilizer, wheat, uh, mining countries like Chile, uh, Peru are selling copper uh, and other products to China. That's where the source of the trade is. U.S. investment in these countries creates high-value jobs in technology, services, um, we are providing manufactured goods. That uh, trade creates high-value jobs. One-third of the economy of Brazil is created by U.S. American Chamber of Commerce member companies. So that, that's a statement on the, the value of what our... our uh now, staying with China, um, we are still paying the price for our withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, and I believe that one of the results of that may be that China obviously wants Taiwan back in the Chinese orbit, uh, the communist Chinese orbit. Uh, in your opinion, oh, it's, it's out of your bailiwick. I will tell you, I think that we probably have less than two years before they make their move because, uh, and it depends on the presidential election, but uh, if China makes their move during the current administration, riding the coattails of the absolute disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan, which we're paying the price all over the world, everybody knows they can test us. Uh, I think that uh, what, you, uh, what you have testified here is not enough. And the direct question for Mr. Nichols is, does this budget give you the opportunities to address the threat of China? And the threat of China, the most direct threat, shooting the closest wolf to the sled, would be uh, deterring them from Taiwan. Well, uh, thank you, Congressman. The, our budget does provide us with crucial tools to deal with PRC incursions into our hemisphere. Um, it allows us to strengthen our partners' democracies, to give greater access to education, health care, uh, to provide more opportunities for infrastructure development uh, and to build resilience in democracies that are under pressure from the PRC and other strategic adversaries. How many countries in Central and South America have broken ties with Taiwan over the last two years? So two. Just two. So the, uh, but we, we need to do as much as we can to talk about values in our hemisphere uh, and uh, to make sure that countries appreciate the importance of a strong democratic partner like Taiwan. Um, my time runs short, Ms. Chairman. Thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you. I recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Congressman Stanton. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Chair, thank you to all the outstanding witnesses for being here uh, today. My home state is Arizona, and we have a very close relationship with Mexico. We are neighbors, we are trading partners, and we share a precious resource, the Colorado River. The 1944 U.S.-Mexico Water Treaty between our two countries outlines the parameters for sharing the river's water. Mexico has been a key partner on the river, and the United States has always made its treaty deliveries to Mexico. In recent years, Mexico has contributed in the same way as other basin states in reducing consumption as we face drought. Last year, Mexico's allocation of Colorado River was reduced by 5%. And this year, as the drought has persisted, it was reduced by 7%. These cuts, combined with significant cuts taken by Arizona and Nevada, have been helpful, but they will not be able to reverse the devastating impacts of the ongoing 23-year drought, a drought that threatens the entire Colorado River ecosystem and all who rely on it. 
We all have an interest in protecting the system from collapse. Recently, the lower basin states, Arizona, Nevada, and Cal California, reached an agreement to conserve an additional 3 million acre feet of water over the next three years to protect water levels in Lake Mead and Lake Powell, but we cannot do it alone. This crisis needs an all hands on deck approach from all basin users, including Mexico. Assistant Secretary Nichols, as a cooperative work through the International Boundary and Water Commission and the Department of Interior continues. I hope the United States will work expeditiously with all basin stakeholders to ensure our two countries are able to protect the Colorado River in the near term and lay the groundwork for long-term solutions to this looming disaster before it is too late. Assistant Secretary Nichols, can you provide us an update on discussions with Mexico on this most important issue? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, the work of the International Boundary Water Commission is vital to address this in, uh, increasing challenge uh, for both of our countries. Uh, we have continued to negotiate, as you laid out, um, the way forward to deal with lower water levels and to address Mexico's deficit uh, in um, feeding water into the system. Uh, the efforts will continue. Uh, Mexican farmers, just as U.S. farmers, as well as urban populations, will need to make significant adjustments to their water consumption and look for infrastructure investments that will uh, allow water to be conserved uh, through things like uh, uh, runoff control, uh, as well as better treatment options. Uh, as this process goes forward, we hope to be able uh, to ensure a steady, safe, reliable supply of water for both of our countries. I appreciate that. Uh, your role is critical. We can't come up with a global solution to the 1,200-year drought, the worst drought in 1,200 years uh, along the Colorado River unless Mexico is a full partner, and that has to do with international agreements. And so uh, time's ticking away. It's, it's a critical time right now to reach those full agreements. Now turning to illicit fentanyl trade, which is one of the State Department's top priorities. Um, I recently spoke with Secretary Blinken about this during a full Foreign Affairs Committee hearing and in a small roundtable, and I want to continue working with the Department of State to stop the flow of fentanyl and the traffic, traffic, tragic excuse me, overdoses that follow. Assistant Secretary Robinson, you were part of the delegation to discuss implementation of the Mexico-United States Bicentennial Framework for Security, Public Health, and Safe Communities this past April. Knowing that President Lopez Obrador has dismissed Mexico's role in the fentanyl trade, can you expand upon your efforts to work with Mexico on counter narcotics within and outside the framework and how you see that collaboration evolving? Thank you, Congressman, for the, for the question. Uh, the, the fact is uh, the Department of State, Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of Justice are all working together uh, um, in an interagency uh, fashion with our counterparts in Mexico uh, on things like uh, technology, uh, making sure that they're not using uh, Chinese technology, PRC uh, technology uh, at the border. Uh, we are working with them on investigations. Uh, we are working with them on uh, uh, capacity building and training for th their forces that are uh, that are uh, challenged by the narcotics traffickers. Uh, we've also recognized uh, the, in the role and responsibility of the United States in this in terms of guns and money going south. Uh, the Department of Justice uh, is working very closely with the Mexican uh, Prosecutor General uh, to uh, increase the amount of uh, investigations and prosecutions uh, in that regard. Uh, it is a challenge, and one of the biggest challenges, uh, frankly, is that uh, right now Mexico is not investing enough in its security apparatus and its uh, uh, prosecutorial uh, apparatus uh, as we are, as the United States is. Uh, and part of our challenge, part of our uh, obligation is to convince them to do more on that front. Okay, well, please let us know how we can support those very, very important efforts um, in your Opening statement, you talked about some uh, low-hanging fruit, um, the providing of the 500 drug-sniffing dogs at, with Mexican law enforcement that's been very successful in finding almost 500,000 fentanyl pills just recently. Uh, what other specific projects are you working on, and how does your budget request support those efforts? Well, the, we are, the, budget, the budget request 
uh, is essentially uh, flatlined from 2022. Uh, but we th we feel like we have uh, we feel like we are uh, devoting enough resources on capacity building, technology, um, uh, the the canines that we mentioned. Uh, we need to get the, the Mexicans uh, to do more. Uh, we also think we need to look at how we can uh, make the, the business of crossing the border more efficient. Uh, we have a, uh, a study out that we are, that we, we and the government of uh, Mexico worked on together uh, to look at uh, how we can uh, move licit uh, goods faster and more efficiently across the border while at the same time uh, uh, stopping the illicit trade that goes across the border. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, and now I recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Congressman Davidson. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Chairwoman, and uh, appreciate the work you guys are doing, uh, or I should say that are supposed to be doing. Some of it, obviously, we disagree on. Um, I'm encouraged, frankly, by the testimony. I, I, I'm, uh, Mr. Robinson, you just talked about paying attention to the influence that China has with technology and other things there. I, I, I note that the, the administration has made some efforts towards China's uh, abusive practices in fishing the waters uh, off of uh, Chile and Ecuador, for example. And um, but, you know, what makes the news a lot, maybe it's all because of the media's focus, is, you know, climate change and gender priorities uh, and, and social agendas that you're trying to push on more culturally conservative countries like Guatemala. So, you know, I'd like to focus on the real threats to our uh, security in the region. And when you think about uh, that, I was encouraged by the emphasis on fentanyl. Um, and that really ties back to uh, one of the big threats is China. I mean, the chemicals are coming from China, uh, you know, and the cartels are happy to sell just about anything to make money. Uh, uh, Mr. Nichols, is China making money um, or, or is China just subsidizing the fentanyl? What's the China motive for supplying all these chemicals to the cartels to kill our people? Uh, we've raised our concerns with China in a number of uh, different fora. Uh, Chinese private companies take advantage of the opportunity to sell chemical precursors to, as well as from other countries, India, for example, uh, sell uh, chemical precursors to illicit organizations in Mexico which are used to produce fentanyl. Uh, and uh, we have to work together uh, in the international community to combat the illicit production of synthetic drugs. I uh, defer to my learned colleague, Todd Robinson, on, on how we're doing that in detail. Uh, it, it's your, your concerns are our concerns. Uh, we know that there's more the PRC can do uh, in terms of uh, uh, being a better partner in the global community. There are things like know your, know your customer, uh, uh, laws that they could uh, that they could uh, implement. If we hooked uh, them up with an OFAC regime and sanctions on the companies that are supplying these chemicals and the individuals affiliated with them, would that help the effort? It, well, not only will it help the effort, it is helping the effort. We are we have just over the last few weeks sanctioned a number of Chinese private uh, pr PRC uh, uh, private companies that we know are illicitly trafficking uh, uh, precursor chemicals. And can so that continue into um, Mexico, Central and South America uh, for the individuals that take possession and delivery of these chemicals? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I'm encouraged by that, and th so thanks for your efforts there. And you know, Mr. Nichols, when you look at you know, big challenges in the Western Hemisphere and, and the role of China, historically the U.S you know, had something referred to as the Monroe Doctrine. We took a special interest in the entire Western Hemisphere. And, you know, there were positive attributes to that, negative connotations, certainly of uh, a reference to the Monroe, Monroe Doctrine. But the America uh, paying, you know, a principal interest in the, in the Western Hemisphere seems to have waned. We seem to have become more passive uh, over a long period of time. Uh, and China has used that. They've, they've definitely grown their influence in a way that historically the United States didn't really tolerate. When did that change in your estimation and why? 
the president's budget uh, provides or requests a 20 percent increase in funding for our programs in this hemisphere. Last year, President Biden hosted the leaders from across our hemisphere in Los Angeles for the Summit of the Americas. Uh, Secretary Blinken has traveled throughout the hemisphere, as have I and numerous other senior officials at this table and in our department and around the cabinet. Yeah. Uh, we are very focused on this hemisphere. We have to bring all the tools to bear that we have across the interagency to support our partners in this hemisphere. They don't want these influences from the outside in the vast majority of the countries in this hemisphere. We have to provide them with good options so, so that they can grow and be successful. So you're trying, we're just not succeeding well enough. This is a, Which is as why I you said, want more money. This is why I said this is the most challenging moment I've seen uh, in 30 years in our hemisphere, and we have to do everything that we can to help our neighbors and our partners uh, around the, the region uh, to succeed and to resist um, these strategic competitors from outside of our region. All right. My last question would just be, you know, why the selective enforcement? The chairwoman kind of talked about it, but it seems like, you know, if, if you've got a left-leaning government like in Mexico or Venezuela uh, or Nicaragua, then, you know, you kind of get a little bit of a free pass with the administration, you know. Uh, but if you've got a right-leaning government, well, we want to talk about social agendas or we want to talk about something else. We want to limit our relationship. We want to apply pressure to those, or those countries. And we seem to, you know, how do we improve relations with these left-leaning countries? Why, why is that? Uh, there's absolutely uh, no selective enforcement, uh, sir. There, we're, our focus is on supporting democracy, uh, private sector-led growth, and opportunities for the middle class throughout the hemisphere. Has uh, the effort inside El Salvador uh, improved the safety and security for the people of El Salvador? So uh, El Salvador, uh, in this request, will get uh, $125 million in bilateral assistance from the United States. Um, El Salvador is a country uh, with deep ties to the United States. We're committed to helping the Salvadoran people uh, to address the needs that they have. Uh, and certainly there's been uh, a substantial improvement in security in El Salvador uh, over the course of the last two years. Uh, but there are also significant concerns about due process and respect for human rights in El Salvador. And we have to balance those things uh, and act in our interests, um, which is why uh, we're the leading provider of foreign assistance to El Salvador and have been for a generation. Thank you. Appreciate your answers and uh, best, best of uh, success in your efforts. And now recognize for five minutes the gentlewoman from California, Kamal Jojo. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our witnesses uh, for being here today. I also want to thank Ranking Member Castro for mentioning the continued wrongful detention of my constituent, Avon Hernandez, who was imprisoned by the Venezuelan government last March, and I will say that we need to bring him home. Uh, I too want to talk about real issues that no one seems to care about. I have four questions and I hope you all will be succinct because I don't have a lot of time. So the first issue is Haiti. Assistant Administrator Escobari, uh, the administration recently released a 10-year country plan for implementation of the Global Fragility Act in Haiti and how does phase one differ from our existing efforts to bolster Haiti's security and what is the timeline to launch and implement this part of the strategy. Thank you, Congresswoman, for um, your interest in and commitment to Haiti. Um, the situation is, is terrible and untenable, and what the GFA has allowed us to do is create this 10-year plan, understanding that the situation is continuously changing. Uh, the difference is really, we've always worked closely with our interagency partners, but I think it has uh, taken it to a different level. We are in daily contact with INL and thinking about how our programming can complement their support with the Haitian National Police. So we are about to launch our 12.5 million citizen security project that is part of the GFA, and the idea is for it to really tightly complement as communities are um, um, are supported by the HMP, we can come in with youth programs and, and community resources so that that piece can be made. 
Well, it needs to be sustainable. I mean, we have to find some partners and just commit people to countries to standing in the gap and helping Haiti because no one has helped Haiti since Haiti freed itself. Okay, moving on. Abusing women. Um, Latin America is plagued with some of the highest rates of gender-based violence in the world, and it's only worsened since the pandemic, and it's especially true for migrant women. So Assistant Secretary Noyes, how does Safe from the Start Revisioned differ from and improve on its predecessor version? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Representative, for that question. Safe from the Start Revisioned is a combined effort by the bureau that I lead together with USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Affairs. And what it does is focus on trying to prevent gender-based violence from the beginning of a crisis situation and the way that, and it's been quite successful, the way that the revisioned, the updated version of the program works is to put more emphasis on the role of the women themselves in determining how they need help and to give them more ability and authority to do so. But gender, combating gender-based violence is, is a key aspect of all of our programs. And I was, the chair asked about my visit to Necocli. When I was in Necocli, I, uh, I visited a program that really, that really hit me uh, because it was a gender-based violence program. And I got this sticker, which I've kept on my desk since then. And it says in Spanish, para, si te ama no te golpea, stop. If he loves you, he won't hit you. This is what those types of programs do. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I noticed that there's a request in there as well, a budget request. So there, right. I'm sure this is also part of the budget request. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, correct. Thank you. Correct. No, just to reinforce that USAID has this as one of our top priorities, exactly for what you said. It's that the rates are untenable in, in, in Latin America and some things are not improving like teenage pregnancies, well, they're improving anywhere, everywhere else in the globe. So I actually, a few weeks ago, while I was in Guatemala, announced $54 million of, of, uh, of programming on gender-based violence, and it focused on impunity, protection, education, and, uh, and improving the judicial system, as well as protecting the victims. Okay, thank you. Use up all the time, because no, 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 I no, only no. have I five just minutes. Wanna, I just want to say INL is also involved in programming for gender-based violence. Okay, great. Uh, let's talk about the Caribbean. People don't seem to care about the Caribbean. Um, and I believe that Caribbean nations have an outsized influence on our national security, but are often overlooked. Uh, maybe it's because folks there are brown. Assistant Secretary Nichols, what progress has been made over the past year in realizing PAC's 2030s commitment? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, well, tomorrow I'll be traveling with the Vice President to meet with uh, CARICOM leaders in the Bahamas. Uh, we have increased assistance uh, and cooperation in the areas of uh, energy, climate finance, access to um, sustainable agricultural practices, um, climate change resilience and adaptation. Uh, with our Caribbean partners. We're going to redouble that effort. We're working to ensure that they have uh, the tools that they need to succeed. We're cooperating in law enforcement areas, particularly uh, to deal with narcotics trafficking and illicit weapons trafficking in the region. We're working on economic opportunity and prosperity um, across the region. But I interestingly, the Caribbean has the highest uh, growth rate uh, uh, in the hemisphere, Guyana, uh, is growing at about 40% a year uh, over the last year. So um, this is a really exciting area. There are a lot of challenges that we have ahead. Um, this budget provides continued resources to help address those, uh, and it's vitally important. Uh, the President Biden met with Caribbean leaders uh, during the Summit of the Americas. Uh, the Vice President has followed up several times uh, and is looking forward to traveling tomorrow. Thank you. Um, well, you know, Madam Chair, I did want to ask uh, Assistant Secretary Robinson uh, to describe the main challenges to combating illicit gold mining in Peru and Colombia, but I do know that my time is up, so. So, um, I, um, I, I don't think we're going to go to a second round to, uh, to the delight of our uh, witnesses. Uh, we are going to um, uh, we are going to yeah due to their 
we're going to end the hearing, but due to technical difficulties, I have to recognize myself to re-deliver my opening statements, which I'm going to make shorter. And uh, once again, I want to thank all of you for being here and looking forward to see you uh, at another time in the near future. So um, with your permission, I'm going to re- there was some technical, some technical issues that we needed to um, retape or redeliver my my opening statement. So um, it is my opinion that President Joe Biden has taken every opportunity to ignore our allies in Latin America, and I'm going to explain why with uh, with few examples. In May of 2021, Vice President Harris challenged United States corporations to invest in Latin America to solve the migration crisis. In that spirit, Ecuador requested a free trade agreement with the United States, but they were ignored. Until today, Ecuador is the only country in Latin America's Pacific coast that doesn't have a free trade agreement with the United States. Uruguay pleaded for a trade deal as well. Despite their democratic record, they have been ignored. As a consequence, last year, both countries took their businesses elsewhere. They took them to China. Chinese trade with Latin America has exploded from 12 billion in 2000 to almost 500 billion last year, making it their biggest trading partners. By contrast, the Oval Office has graciously welcomed Colombia's President Gustavo Petro, who is a socialist, Argentina's President Alberto Fernandez, whose VP Cristina Kirchner is among the most corrupt politicians in South America, and Brazil's President Lula da Silva, who was sentenced to 12 years in prison for corruption before returning to power. Shockingly, this administration has denied that welcoming gesture to conservative presidents since entering the White House. For example, Guatemala's President Jamate told me personally that he felt disregarded by President Biden. We may not like his policies, but we have to work with him. In the Caribbean, our ally, President Abinader from the Dominican Republic, has been overlooked despite his aggressive anti-corruption measures. On top of that, the White House issued a travel ban that labeled the Dominicans racist, damaging their tourism industry for six months. And when I asked Secretary Blinken to provide evidence Nothing was presented. Thankfully, the State Department lifted that ban. President Biden also rejected a visit from President Najib Bukele of El Salvador. President Bukele inherited the most dangerous country in Latin America, and in three years, he's made it a safe haven for tourism and for investment. Panama, a Panamanian foreign minister, informed my office of their request to buy helicopters and military vehicles from the Biden administration to, secu to secure the Darien Gap. Panama didn't want anything for free. They wanted tools to secure the bottleneck between South and Central America, and they're still waiting. I believe that ignoring our allies in Latin America is a vacuum that is being filled by China, Russia, and Iran. In another case, a few days after President Biden stopped buying oil from Russia, top Latin American advisor, Mr. Juan Gonzalez, got on a plane to visit President Maduro. But at the time, Maduro wasn't even recognized as the legitimate president of Venezuela and was on the FBI's most wanted list for $15 million on his head. We struck a deal to buy some of the dirtiest oil produced on the planet. And I waited, I'm waiting to hear complaints from environmentalists in the Biden administration, but they have remained silent. Cuba, the regime that has spread the most anti-American poison in the last 60 years, the, this, con this uh, government has removed the cap on remittances to give more oxygen to the repressive apparatus. We have welcomed the Coast Guard to our military installations, and we have sent delegations to the island to add insult to injury, the Cuban regime has recently announced that Cuban soldiers are going to be going to Russia to be on the front lines fighting in Ukraine. I believe that this budget doesn't reflect reality. Your actions show that you have ignored key allies to the benefit of our enemies. So now I'm going to say the same uh, short message in Spanish for our neighbors in South America and Central America. 
a los países de América Latina, les pedimos disculpas por el mal rato y menosprecio que han recibido por parte de la administración del presidente Biden. Es inconcebible que Estados Unidos ignore a los aliados del hemisferio y que han demostrado los mismos valores de libertad y democracia y libre mercado que defendían los padres fundadores de los Estados Unidos. Este comité en el Congreso Federal tiene un compromiso de levantar sus voces en el corazón de esta institución. Y en el Partido Republicano al que yo represento hay gente que sabe respetar a los vecinos, a los aliados de los Estados Unidos que tanto apreciamos. Thank you then, and now we are dismissing, so let me read the proper, the chair right here. No, it's in the back. Right here. All right, so I thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. The members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to them in writing. Pursuant to the committee rules, all members may have five days to submit statements, questions, and extraneous materials for the record, subject to the length limitations. Without objections, the committee stands adjourned. And thanks again to all of you.